biogeochemist Vladimir Vernadsky, in his 1943 elaboration of a recent revolutionary step in the process of maturity of the noosphere, attributes to 19th century American geologist James Dwight Dana the elaboration of the law that evolution never goes backward. It may halt or stay still for long periods of time, but it will never reverse. That is, devolution never occurs. That furthermore, this ceaseless evolution cannot be understood chronologically, but rather can only be understood as though in reverse, as if catching an unfinished painting mid-stroke. We have already shown a few cases detailing system-wide evolution. Here, we will take up Dana's measure of this directed development, a measure he terms cephalization, to which we will add some advances in the field since his time and draw out the implications of his results for the role of mind, and especially man's wielding of mind in the evolutionary process. From his researches in geological history and through a struggle to find an accurate measure for biological time, Dana made the empirical generalization that evolution shows an indubitable direction of development, that amongst a lineage of forms, the entire form and relative functions of the body invariably tends away from serving locomotion and toward a freedom to serve mind whether the particular species which eventually manifests such freedoms has a mind or not, thereby implicating mind, even before the existence of mankind, as the invariant demanding the substrate for a future willfully creative state. As far as form is concerned, within each lineage, more advanced species show characteristics of limbs which face forward rather than sideways, limbs that are more suited to serve the specific function of a central processing center rather than locomotion, senses that are more concentrated and specialized, compactness, upward rise in the nervous system, and in general characteristics that express higher levels of centralization, that is, cephalization. For example, among crustaceans, in passing from shrimp-like to crab-like, we see a compacting of the structure from both the front and behind, as well as a centralization of the senses and mouth about the head. We also see a decreasing number of limbs used exclusively for locomotion, together with a corresponding transference of both the number and the strength of limbs to the exclusive service of the head and mouth. Among arthropods, insects are the most cephalized, miniaturizing the key aspects of crustaceans and forming the greatest distinction between head and the rest of the body. Among mammals, which are more cephalized than any in the animal kingdom, there is a great variety in levels of cephalization. The strength of whales, for example, is in their huge tail, which serves for locomotion, while having proportionally small brains, which are situated far from the head, and furnished with poor organs of sense. Terrestrial herbivores, such as horses and oxen, lose the tail altogether as a locomotive force, and move that function slightly forward to the legs although the legs are still used purely for locomotion. For many carnivores and omnivores, the function of the front limbs become shared between locomotion and cephalic activity. Humans, however, are the only ones which have limbs which are not shared with locomotion at all, but rather exclusively serve the mind. The entire form has moved underneath the head, giving the head the highest possible position. And the head and brain are, by energy required, a large portion of the whole. 
human senses are also extremely centralized and specialized, and again, are not used for navigation alone, a fact we will return to shortly. Therefore, according to Dana's criterion, the human form expresses the maximum level of cephalization possible. This development leads us to a slightly disturbing implication. If the process of cephalization has reached a peak in the human form, does that mean that evolution into higher states has also reached its limit? Can the future only hope to expect devolution, stagnation, or mere fine-tuning? Before tackling that question, let's first take a look inside. Starting with a few creatures more primitive than the ones we've considered up to this point. For example, this jellyfish has no brain. In fact, it has very little of anything, and yet it still manages to move, eat, mate, and respond to its environment. All this by means of a net of nerves which is loosely distributed throughout its body. If while it drifts along with minimal propulsion, it happens to contact something warm, it automatically shoots poisonous stingers, not really knowing otherwise where the disturbance came from. Besides this immediate local reaction, however, since it has no center of reference, it has no sense of where relative to itself the disturbance was felt. So the resultant reaction is a motion of the whole body. Between jellyfish and other similar invertebrates, and more complex organisms such as insects and crustacea, there are a wide variety of neural nets, from completely evenly distributed to a partially centralized system. This decentralization is also the reason that the cutting of a starfish or a flatworm in half effectively spawns new ones. As we get to insects and crustacea, however, the structure is qualitatively different. Both have a cord running along the abdomen, connecting various nerve centers to a brain, which itself is more of a nerve center which happens to control the mouth and head. This similarity may be the reason that Dana refers to crustacea as diluted insects. Unlike a neural net, in the insect, this confederate nervous system does allow very defined, precise sense perceptions, which include senses which currently are not commonly wielded by humans. The response to these senses, though localized, however, is not entirely conscious. For example, the immediate response to landing for a fly is to stop flapping whether that is advantageous or not at the moment. Upon severance of its head, it will stay alive until it starves to death. Even a more intelligent species such as the octopus has similar traits. For example, after an octopus sees something it wants to eat, it first sends a signal from its head brain to its arm brain of which it has four, one for each two tentacles. The arm then independently decides the mode of action to carry the command out. Consequently, if the arm responds in a certain way to a jab, it will respond the same way even when the connecting nerves are severed from the rest of the body. That is, they literally have a mind, or at least a brain, of their own. Conversely, the octopus cannot use the stimulation from its several arms to determine the overall shape of an object it is holding, aside from looking at what its arms are doing. We find a further qualitative leap with vertebrate animals. 
Vertebrate animals introduce the spinal cord and brain system integrated into a unit. We see here the nervous systems of a chicken, an alligator, and a cat. Compared to insects, which taste with their feet, such as do flies, or hear with their waist, as do moths, vertebrate senses are much closer to a central location. However, as mentioned before, among vertebrates, the variation of degrees of cephalization show the type of direction the mind is striving for. For example, one indication that the chicken does not have complete control over its nervous system is seen in the famous case of Mike the Headless Chicken, who survived for two years without a head. From just a preliminary look at several systems and the relationship between various senses in the brain, you can see that the human system is maximally centralized. In fact, so much so that various levels of synesthesia, that is, when senses intermingle, are not uncommon. As a result, humans are much more in control of how we respond to the senses and therefore have comparatively few automatic reactions to our palette of sensations. Now let's return to the question. What is the purpose of this incredible development? Does the reaching of a maximum state as expressed by humans, indicate the height of evolution. Is this extreme centralization and control of our senses the ultimate purpose of this whole process? And is therefore evolution driving toward an end to evolution? Are we to be the ultimate sensual being? Or is this whole process yet a means to an end? The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. Ironically, the increasing control of the senses is also the key to superseding and becoming increasingly independent of them. As Friedrich Schiller elaborates in his letters on the aesthetical education of man, the control of the senses is only the beginning of cognition. The root of science is the realization that what you directly sense is not reality, but only a projection. Through contradiction and juxtaposition of different senses, we can form a reality beyond our senses. We experience a motion of the mind, which is the play instigated by these juxtapositions, which itself more closely approximates the cause of those projections. As a result, our actions can be based on acting on those causes instead of the projections of those causes. Shakespeare is able to communicate an idea that cannot be explained literally because he is conscious that he is inducing an idea that exists only as the act of play your mind goes through in dealing with the paradox. True universal principles, scientific or otherwise, can only be conceived in this way. Since principles, and especially universal ones, cannot be seen as a finite object, the closest concept we can have exists as a precise paradox. This was demonstrated by Johannes Kepler, who defined universal gravitation as the juxtaposition and constant play between the harmonies of the visual domain and that of the auditory. Neither individually were right, nor was a simple interposition of the two, as though lying one shadow on top of another. But the constant play the mind goes through in resolving these shadows into one not entirely graspable universal cause, is what Kepler defined as universal gravitation. From this vantage point, mind takes front seat, acting not merely as an observer of the brain, while the brain provides a vessel or processing center 
for the collection of sensory impressions received, but rather actively demands the substrate to harmonize with the universe, as seen in the development of the bodily structure and the nervous system, including the brain, to provide itself the projection necessary to increase its power for understanding cause, as well as its power to actually act on the universe. Furthermore, mankind did not stop at only the senses and capabilities we are born with, but has crafted new senses, extending the domain of conscious action of the mind far beyond the bodily form. We have created numerous instruments for projection, mechanical and biological, and as we have done so, each new sense adds a new dimensionality to the possibilities for juxtaposition and thus discovery of principle. While continuing in the same direction as demanded by mind, the emergence of mankind has marked the emergence of a species whose means of evolution has superseded change in physical form. Though there is no doubt that as we gain new senses, physical changes especially in internal organization, will continue. As a result, the so-called species of mankind can only be defined as that species which evolves according to the same process as has occurred throughout geological time, but that willfully. As the conditions we are experiencing today show us in this moment of history, if we deny that privilege, and therefore that obligation, we will go extinct like 98% of all species which have ever existed. The alternative is, we can accept our role by taking the next steps we in our extraterrestrial start. imperative Two, and continually one. redefine how far or close the mind can reach. Thank you.